The Jefferson County Drug Ca Task Force is a multi-jurisdictional, multi multiple agency task force. The localized task force is comp comprised of Jefferson County law enforcement agencies, which include the Fort Atkinson Police Department, Jefferson County Sheriff's Office, the Jefferson De Police Department, the Village of Johnson Creek Police Department, the Lake Mills Police Department, the Town of Lake Mills Police Department, the Waterloo Police Department, and the Watertown Police Department, with the Jefferson County District Attorney's Office involved as a cooperating entity. In 2005, the Jefferson County Drug Task Force was a founding member of the multi-juridictional group CDOG, Southeast Area Drug Operations Group. This group was organized to better utilize resources and to share information between members' agencies, resulting in enhanced overall operations of each participating agency. The mission of CDOG is to increase public safety and improve the quality of life in our communities through collaborative efforts that develop and implement programs to reduce the prevalence of substance abuse and decrease the incident of violent crimes associated with drug activity. This is what the Jefferson County Drug Task Force does. Thank you. Open our hearts, free every soul The fear inside, you must let it go Oh, that monster Before it conquers you Yeah We all have demons, we fight every day You get knocked down, but the bell hasn't rang So keep going Just stay focused When life seems hard before life passes you by, you must Shine. Like a bird with broken wings always Shine. You've got to reach for the stars It might seem far
I think the biggest piece of advice I have for someone going through addiction or thinking about going to rehab is being honest with yourself. Don't be afraid to get help. I think that's the biggest stigma that we're trying to erase is, is don't be afraid to ask for help. Welcome back to ICANN. Today we are interviewing Detective Sergeant Dan Hervatten from the Jefferson County Drug Task Force. How you doing, Dan? Doing well. Thanks for having me, Christine. Um, first, tell us a little bit about you and what you do for the task force. Um, so I'm the Detective Sergeant of the Jefferson County Drug Task Force, uh, which is a multi-jurisdictional task force. So all the member agencies in Jefferson County, law enforcement agencies, uh, for the most part, are participants in the task force. So I've been with the Sheriff's Department for 23 years. I started in our jail. I worked in our courthouse security and uh, civil process division. I worked patrol. Uh, prior to taking this assignment, I was a detective for about six years. Okay. Uh, so, and I've been for approximately the last four and a half years running the Jefferson County Drug Task Force. The, tra the drug task force, what it, I mean, what areas does it cover besides so, uh, Jefferson? Yeah, so Jefferson County in general, but we also work with our neighboring uh, drug units. So we'll work with Dane County, we'll work with the state, Walworth County, Waukesha County, Dodge County. Okay. Um, and part of the reason uh, to have a multi-jurisdictional task force is because um, criminal activity doesn't know jurisdictional boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. um, lots of times we're dealing with people that are you know, Madison people that come out to our area, or okay. Milwaukee people that come out to our area and sell drugs and um, or other things. Mm -hmm. And so it's important that we have the, the network of people that we can communicate with and work with um, to deal with those problems. What led you to becoming a part of the drug task force? Was there something behind it or it was just a step forward or? Yes, so when I was a detective, um, you really see some of the issues that come up. There's so many things when I was investigating just um, regular crimes that, and when I say regular, no crime's regular. They're right. Just, um, but um, as a general detective, just all the different things that we investigate, um, you know, small petty, petty thefts up to death investigations. Mm -hmm. um, but lots of times there's a drug component to it. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, the amount of collateral crimes, whether it's child abuse and things like that, um, really makes a difference. And so um, I was selected and um, as one of the two detective sergeants, and um, that was my assignment, um, mm -hmm. which I wasn't originally kind of interested uh, in that, but um, I definitely know the value and, and obviously see the value of, of that because again so many times we see mm -hmm. um, the issues that are associated with not just drug use and really we're more sympathetic to the users and trying to get them treatment right but but drug dealing and the associated problems you know child abuse thefts all the different things that come along with it overdoses um, you know, having to talk to a mother who's lost their son mm -hmm. to an unattended drug overdose, that's, that's really tough, right? So, yeah. um, so that those are kind of some of the reasons. And um, I mean, it's a problem that's never going to go away. We hope that we could get more treatment for our people so that, so that they're not addicted, um, mm -hmm. which is definitely a key component. But Since... Uh COVID, has you seen a huge increase of the drug issues? Good question. So one of the interesting things we saw with COVID, uh, when the border was, pretty much everything was shut down, um, it was very difficult to get certain drugs in the community and the prices went way up. And, and there were other drugs that then fill, came in to fill the, the, the void. And then um, after everything kind of opened up with COVID, uh, we saw a pretty significant increase again, especially in cocaine, for example, mm -hmm. um, which yes, is very plentiful now. What do you think is our worst drug in this area? Um, well, it's a combination of things. So 
we see a lot of the fentanyl pills. Yep. So like the fake Percocets. Yep. Yep. Um, and then, which are obviously the most catastrophic, usually um, fentanyl, because people are dying a lot from yep. it. Yep. Um, but then we're seeing also crack and crack cocaine a lot and meth as well, so. Do you think our area has a problem? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I think is kind of different with um, the way um, drug users and dealers kind of operate, they operate a little bit more under the radar, but also I think it's, as uh, you probably know, the education component. Um, we've been involved in educating probation and parole officers, human services folks, uh, and others because they don't, if you don't know what to look for, you mm -hmm. might not see it and it might just be, you know, kind of in right. plain sight. And so part of that education component is really important. And, and then what we do at the task force a lot of times is not publicized because mm -hmm. we're working always to try and get to the bigger fish, so right. to speak. Right. Um, the users, we want to get them the treatment they need mm -hmm. and then actually get the people that mm -hmm. are really uh, causing serious damage to mm -hmm. people's lives. So. Now I know there's a, like a pipeline through from Chicago through Jefferson or through uh, I think it's uh, Portage and Stevens Point that area. Well, we have so what's interesting about Jefferson County is it's kind of uniquely situated. So when I was presenting to our different municipalities, one of the challenges for us is that we have I-94 and we're right between Madison and Milwaukee, mm -hmm. but then also. 26, um, we have a lot of people coming from the Chicago Rockford area as well. So, so we're kind of in that, in that middle place where lots of people will either go Madison or Milwaukee, but we still have Janesville, Beloit, and uh, Rockford mm -hmm. coming up from the south as well. Now, the last time I talked to you, you were telling me about a couple huge busts that happened here in the area. Can you tell us a little about sure. that? Sure. So one of the other things that's um, going on and don't talk a lot, a lot about it, but um, so we have drug cartel mm -hmm. um, cartels operating in and around our area. Um, it's not just obviously Jefferson County. Um, I know we're seeing that in Madison, Milwaukee sees it. Mm -hmm. So it's not unique to us, but um, we've had a couple different um, operations that one that was related to something going on in Watertown and uh, um, as a result, we ended up um, seizing eight and a half kilos of cocaine. Wow. So eight and a half kilos of cocaine for the average person. Uh, one kilo is 2.2 .2 pounds. So it's around 18 pounds. Wow. Um, which is significant. Yeah. Um, and then a joint operation, a, sec a second operation um, that was um, from the DEA Walworth County and us working together, there was a second seizure of 141 kilos of cocaine. Oh my goodness. Which is um, unbelievable. Yeah. Um, talking to them, uh, the DEA told us, you know, that's probably one of the largest single seizures they've seen in Wisconsin. Wow. Um, and we know that it wasn't just designated for our area, but it was designated to go other places. And so, so it was through like the pipeline of. Yes. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's. I don't think I would have expected that no. as well no. um, at that particular time. But we know that um, there's a lot of things obviously going on underneath the radar. Um, we've seen a lot of people, again, coming from Madison, Milwaukee, and outside our area to sell drugs. Um, a lot of it has to do with the fact that people will pay more for the drugs out here. So. Um, and also, I think the perception is there's not as many law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So they, they kind of can remain under the radar for a lot longer and make more money. Now, with these seizures, how, how did you find out about it? I mean... Yeah, the details of that, I can't go into. Right, but um, so, vaguely. Yeah, so we always start, a lot of times, our street-level people, mm -hmm. um, which then would potentially lead to other information, surveillance, and then we kind of go through our whole investigative process and then um, ends up, you know, either we get a tip or, or just based on the knowledge of what 
what we've done, and there's obviously tons of different investigative strategies that we utilize, um, then it was one of those situations where um, sometimes coincidence, I don't know if that's, that's really true, but based on the investigation that was we moved at the right times. So, when you have find an investigation and it comes together, how do you? How does it make you feel? It's great, uh, but I know you know that it's only the tip of the iceberg, yeah, right? Yeah, which yeah. is, which is um, challenging. It's frustrating. Some people would say, "Well, it's just one thing," and uh, are you really making a difference? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think. In certain circumstances, I understand their perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, it's a problem that, as I said earlier, it's not going to go away per se. Mm -hmm. But um, I think we've been successful in a lot of areas, at least um, keeping some of that out of Jefferson County mm -hmm. and forcing uh, people out of our area. Mm -hmm. And they're scared to come and do business in Jefferson County, which is good. Yeah. Um, one particular seizure that we had, um, a guy was setting up shop in Lake Mills, for example, and he had a, an operation, meth and fentanyl. Okay. Um, he was actually making pills, and he had probably, I think it was a pound and a half of a mixture of fentanyl oh. that was designated to go out. So, I mean, a lethal, potential lethal dose of fentanyl is made yeah. very small. I know, it's just so, on the tip of a pencil. Yeah. So. Um, so that potentially saved countless numbers of yes, lives, right? Yes. Um, and that particular person was a convicted felon. He had ties to some gangs. Um, and so um, it's not something we want taken up shop in, in no, our community. No, no, no. So. Now with the increase in marijuana being legalized everywhere, do you think that's, what kind of damage has that done for drugs itself? Well, so that's, that's an interesting question. A lot of people will say and tell you that marijuana was a gateway to mm -hmm. something else. Um, a great website uh, that provides information about marijuana use is thenmi.org, mm -hmm. um, the National Marijuana Initiative. And what people have seen in the states where legalization has happened is specifically a significant increase in people operating under the influence. Mm -hmm. um, that's, which is problematic, right? Because a drunk driver yeah. doesn't just affect themselves, they affect other right. people right. and could potentially kill people. So um, that is significant. The other thing that is um, something that has been coming about because of heavy marijuana use is the increased risk of schizophrenia. Um, mm. So there was a study or an article by New York Post um, that said that 24 roughly percent of the cases of psychosis they're seeing in emergency rooms was the result of heavy marijuana use. Now, traditionally, when we think of the kind of psychosis associated with drugs, it's usually somebody that we think might have been using methamphetamine very heavy and then have been staying up for long periods of time and were delusional. Um, but now we're seeing that, that heavy marijuana use because of concentrated uh, THC mm -hmm. is pretty significant. And that's definitely a conversation that needs to happen yes. um, around anybody who's thinking about legalization. Because, you know, 24%, one out of four people yeah. that use marijuana heavy, that's Yeah, well, that's and then really the age has a lot to do with it, too. Exactly. The younger they are... Yep. the more it affects you. And then they, then you've got the CBD and the THC and the Delta 8s and 9s. Yep. It's all... Right, and Delta 8, Delta 10, or uh, THC 0, that's legal for yeah, I know. people to buy, which um, there are effects. So when, we're t when we talk with users and ask them, how, does, how is this compared to regular marijuana, for example, they tell us, well, it still gets me high. Mm -hmm. um, and but it's a little bit more mild. Or um, like THC zero or, or whatnot, they'll say, well, that's supposedly you know, more potent than regular mm -hmm. marijuana. So, um, so yeah, it creates challenges for sure. We've had kids at different schools you know, going to the local gas station and getting, yeah. getting edibles, mm -hmm. Delta-8 edibles, 
and then you know they're sick and at school and then they got to get you know taken out of school and things like that so that yeah. is a problem and the 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 kind of trickle down effect to kids is really yeah. significant yeah well and and i've noticed that there's a lot more uh overdoses of little children because the parents have it in their home and then they're also using marijuana and the CBDs together which is making them overdose also. Yes and I mean that's a good point and something I bring up when I talk with groups about the accidental overdoses of kids specifically because of the edibles. Mm -hmm. You know a gummy bear to a little kid yeah. looks like candy. Yeah, I know. And, um, and so you know all the different types of edibles that are being um, you know created and marketed look like a lot of legitimate candies and so that is a significant concern yes for us. yeah ben, ben brought it up at our knowledge is power how they have got uh, looks like cheetos and it says i don't remember how, what it says on it but it is actually tbc or tc THC, THC yes. in it but it's targeting kids right well and so like stoner patch kids yeah. as opposed to yeah you know your regular sour patch kids that's yeah. a common one they have ropes like nerds ropes but they're like stoner ropes or something like oh, that wow. so yeah it's very um it's deceiving and, and and yeah definitely kids are getting a hold of it so how does your job affect your personal life well, my wife and kids would tell you that I'm always seem to be working. Mm -hmm. I have two phones and I'm always on one of them. Someone's texting me. Mm -hmm. So all my team is in the same boat that I am. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's taxing on family life mm -hmm. um, for sure because we're working late at night sometimes um, and very commonly you don't necessarily know when you're going to go home. Detectives have the same same issue. Um, weekends, we're taking calls from people mm -hmm. um, with information. Um, I routinely get called in the middle of the night, although I try and tell them I wake up early. So if you can wait till about 4.30 <laughs> or so in the morning, then I'll be up and you don't have to disturb my sleep. But um, it's, yeah, it does impact your life and we're, um, we definitely see that. Do you think your children learn not, what not to do with drugs because of your job? I think so, but um, you know, peer pressure is always yeah. Yeah. crazy, but I think when you tell them some of the stories and you actually see firsthand some of that um, through either relatives or um, friends mm -hmm. who that's impacted, um, that really makes an impact on, on them for sure. Mm -hmm. What a, Can you tell us as a community, what we can do to change things with this drug? Well, first of all, I think as you're doing, um, education is really important to, so people really know what to look for. Mm -hmm. um, and I would, I think that's a key component of this puzzle um, is the education piece. And I would say another part of that is actually talking to the people who have kind of dealt with the addiction themselves and how it's ruined their lives. I'm, I have the benefit of doing that a lot. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, it is impactful. And I used to be kind of like, oh, that's just their problem. And they, they're going to be, um, they got to be able to deal with it, pull them up with their bootstrap, up by their bootstraps. And um, it's really not easy, right? So mm -hmm. um, especially because the way that there's brain, uh, brain changes from mm -hmm. the use of drugs for a long period of time. And so I think as a society, we really need to look at the treatment component. Mm -hmm. And again, I separate users from dealers. Right. And there's some people who do deal just to supplement their habit, but I, I still break it out with users and dealers because I think it makes a big difference. Oh yeah. The person that you know is feeding an addiction um, it's a challenge for them. And mm -hmm. every day they're just chasing that addiction. And they never really get to become who they really could be mm -hmm. because of their addiction. And so as a community, one of the challenges and things I talk about a lot with the people um, when I'm doing these presentations is that there is really no, in Jefferson County, no treatment facilities. Yep. Yep. 
and resources to really get people they need, that, that, that need help help. Um, if they don't have insurance, and most people end up in that boat, right? Because they yeah. lose their job, they, yep. and then they're living, you know, couch surfing, so to speak. And so they don't have the resources to pay for inpatient treatment, which is really what they need. Mm -hmm. When I talk to the, the different community groups and, and, and the municipalities, I talk about uh, something that Ben Miller probably brought up, which was it takes about 100 days mm -hmm. non-drug use for your brain to actually wow. repair itself to get to a point where, okay, maybe you can make better decisions and at least start to uh, be on that road to recovery. And I think that's something that we need to really look at as uh, a community and as a nation, really. I mean, yeah, I agree there. That treatment facilities will benefit everybody. Maybe they're going to cost a little bit in the short term, but in the long term, you know, the societal consequences, perpetual crimes, and different yeah. things that people commit um, down the road child abuse, sexual assault, all of that stuff. Um, lots of times there's a drug component to it. Well, if we can fix the person, mm -hmm. we'd be better off, mm -hmm. for sure. Oh, definitely. Um, I had a question and now I can think of it. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about the Drug Task Force? I mean, is there ways the community can help the Drug Task Force? Um, I think making sure that people understand the benefits, I, and I talk about this too, the benefits of having officers that are trained mm -hmm. and are part of it, at least in part. Mm -hmm. Some of the things and the skills that the officers develop from doing some of this work, um, number one is empathy. I mm -hmm. mean, yes, definitely. You, you see people at their worst sometimes and you see kind of the, the problems that drugs have created for people's lives. And uh, you really get kind of a sense, a better sense of the world of you know, police work and what, what's really going on. If you're just um, a patrol officer who's not necessarily um, responding so much to these types of inc incidents or talking with these people, you might get just a jaded approach to mm -hmm. um, a lot of the people. Uh, but when you actually do it for, a, you know, a little bit longer time, a year, two, three years, um, you really start to see things, I think, differently. Mm -hmm. um, it gives you a different perspective on, on things. Now, in our area, how many fentanyl overdoses would you say we've had? Um, on average, I think the last stats that I have, and it takes some time, but 2022 was right in the 20 range, give or take. 20 a year? 20 uh, for the year. Okay. But Obviously, um, nationwide, last year was yeah. around 100,000, yeah. I estimated. Um, and so some of the other things that go unreported because of now widespread uh, Narcan availability is how many times people have actually overdosed but survived. Yeah. And there's lots of times that we see that and that either they go unreported or police don't arrive because now the the ambulance has already been there and they're refusing treatment because they've gotten Narcan. So it's more than, you know, the, but just the number of deaths is in the 20s for us in Jefferson County. But that also doesn't necessarily mean there's not more because if right. people are going to other areas mm -hmm. and they end up passing away yeah. um, in Milwaukee or Madison, yeah. we might not get that information. The big hardest part with the Narcan for the elk lodges in the area is, is the they th see it as a easy way out for people that they can just go ahead and keep doing it and then their can can bring them back there's a stigma to it yeah and i think i think in my view the accidental overdoses as well are significant so mm -hmm. i think um, there have been officers who have been exposed kids right and and this is another thing that we've kind of been involved in ben miller was one of the people that really was working with human services and kind of got this um, off the ground for us to the drug endangered children program mm -hmm. and how important that is uh, because what if it's your child that yep. accidentally yep. Yep. Um, gets some residue and they ingest it and watertown had a, a well we've had several cases of drug endangered children 
but they had a particular case. I think it was an, about an 18 month old. Oh no. The kid was unresponsive. They thought maybe originally it was a seizure. So they transport him by ambulance to the hospital. The, they're doing, the doctors are doing everything they can to um, treat this kid and he's not getting better. So the doctor wisely decides, we're gonna just, just out, outside realm of possibility, we're gonna give this kid Narcan. And so the kid became lucid then. Wow. And so we know then that was an opiate overdose yeah. because Narcan specifically binds to the opiate receptor. So as it turns out, we end up doing a search warrant at the, the house um, and it was dad had, um, had overdosed previously um, or relapsed, I should say, and had some things at his house. And so um, there's more to that story, which I won't get into yeah, on camera, yeah, but, but frustrating to say yes. the least, Yeah. Um, because that was not something that the no. father immediately shared with the EMS personnel or law enforcement. And to us, to us, it's like, if that's your kid, yeah. why would you not tell people right away? So that's a possibility. Wow. Um, and so, yeah, there's some sources of frustration there. And thank God the doctor yeah. was able to... Yeah. Um, think and, and, and did treat him with Narcan. You might not, you might have had an 18 month old that was dead, right? Yeah, so, it gives me chills just thinking yeah. about and, it. And, you know, I talk to people and that have overdosed or lost their kids and it is, it's traumatic, right? Mm -hmm. They live with that every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do what we can in those cases. Sometimes it's not as easy because piecing back where they necessarily got the drugs a um, lot of times users hide that information. Right. They delete the information off their phones yeah. um, or there's not the smoking gun that yeah. officers need to be able to go back to be able to look into this further. And it, it becomes a challenge because we might know or suspect who, who did it, mm -hmm. but if we don't have the, the proof to, yeah. to really uh, go that next level, proof, probable cause to get a search warrant or anything like that, you know, we're pretty much then kind of stuck in a yeah. lot of ways. Yeah. And some of the people are hard to find, so it would be great if we could just find them and interview some of the suspected people. Um, but that's not always easy yeah. either, so. Yeah. What do you think the drug task force has uh, in the future to change things? Anything different or? Um, I mean, we continually are working to uh, you know, again, target the dealers in our areas. Um, I wish I could say that we get more people. Um, if we could get more people, obviously we could do more. Mm -hmm. um, law enforcement in general has a lot of significant challenges mm -hmm. just because it's tough to find people who want to do the job. Mm -hmm. um, and getting people is, is a challenge. But that is one component, if I go back to um, just supporting your officers the, and your mm -hmm. local officers, your local departments, um, and getting quality people is important. Um, and I know this is, you know, it's kind of in just in general, but the skills that officers learn like at the task force are things that carry them through their career. Oh, I imagine. Um, and just they learn, learn so much that they can then bring to their communities in other ways after they, they leave. Um, but support of, of your local officers is really important. I know I'm starting to almost preach, right? I could, <laughs> no, I could no. get on a soapbox, but I, I equate it and it's something really simple that I've, I talk to people about and, um, you know, and this, it sounds cliche, but it applies to law enforcement just in general. And that's, you know, you get what you pay for. Yep, so yep. I, I have a dog, she's a great dog. I, she's very smart. I paid a lot of money for her. And, and, um, and so if, if we want to invest in our law enforcement, we're going to have to pay in the, uh, on the upfront side, mm -hmm. right? And nobody likes to hear that, but the catastrophic effects on the back end of not hiring yeah. the right people yep. ends up bringing us to a situation where they do something unethical, yep. they do something illegal, worst case, I mean, someone dies as a yeah. bad decision. And that's as been a happening a lot across the country the last few years. Bad decisions, yeah. And, and, and so 
I think we need to, we, we want to hold our law enforcement to a high standard. I hold myself to a high standard. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. But we need to get the right people. Yep. Because um, without the right people, I mean, as I mentioned, it's easier to train a smart dog than it is, you yeah. know, just a stupid dog. Yeah. Legitimately. And, um, just somebody taking a job just to have a job. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. And, and uh, so quality people make, make a difference, and we, wanna, we want them to make the good decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and so when people can go to a different profession where they're not having to make life or death decisions, um, you know, and they never know when that's going to be, um, that a lot of people are going to do that because nobody wants to see themselves you know, mm -hmm. on the news, nobody yeah. wants to, because of a bad decision they yeah. made. Yeah. Um, whether it was their fault, whether it was a lack of training, um, there's so many factors that go yep. into that. Yep. But um, your average person is like, I don't think I want to be able to no, put myself in that situation. No, it takes a special situation. person to be a police officer. And so, right, and that's, that's it. So um, I think that's an important component that communities need to look at as far as priorities mm -hmm. because I, there is money yeah I think I don't think anybody can argue that there's not the money it's just where we where are we gonna put it mm -hmm. now in your bio it also says that uh, the Jefferson South County Drug Task Force does a free educational presentation to local schools and civic groups can you tell me a little bit about that sure so um, like we've done for the probation and parole agents like we do for human services. Um, if they, community groups want to have a presentation, we will come out, it's a PowerPoint presentation. We'll talk a little bit about some of drugs, some of the things that we've seen in our area. Um, we'll give them a little bit of education on the effects of the different drugs that, mm -hmm. that we're seeing. Um, and then resources, um, you know, if they're seeing certain things, for example, in their neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, our phone numbers and things to contact that they can reach out. And that's an important part, too, that people are concerned that, that well, they don't want to be wrong and they don't want necessarily their name to be put out there. But we keep everything confidential, mm -hmm. which is why at the outset I mentioned, a lot of times we're not, we're, people don't know what we're even doing, right. which is why I had to give um, or I gave presentations to the local municipalities because um, they don't necessarily see the value of the task force and we're paying for things, but we don't even see where that money's going. Yeah, yeah. And so um, I think that's an important component, but the confidentiality component is there. So you don't have to necessarily be right mm -hmm. in what, you're, what you think is going on. You don't have to be able to say 100% I think my neighbor's selling drugs, but um, we, we might just need that little bit of information mm -hmm. to get us to the next level in the investigation because everything is kept confidential. Most people won't know what we information right. we've already right. received. Right. So, um, and we're happy to do the presentations and talk to folks about the different problems. Um, Before we head out, is there anything else you'd like to tell us? Um, I'd just like to thank the Elks for doing what they're doing and I think you're doing Thank you. An important service to our communities. I hope people will take the time to, yeah, you know, listen, listen to it, put down their phones, and actually uh, be cognizant. Because this is really something that is needed um, in the communities. Mm -hmm. um, if you have the ability to talk to your elected officials and work towards um, in countywide, getting a treatment facility for sure yeah, yeah, definitely. is um, one of those things that I think we need to have the, the conversation and get people uh, to be a part of, mm -hmm. you know, work towards. Yeah. Um, I know, and again, talking to folks that have addictions, they tell me all the time, right, that, that they don't have the uh, ability or the resources to get help and they want help mm -hmm. and they don't want to continue to live like this. Um, but there's no help out there. But the, the help isn't there. And, and I'll just give you another example. So probation and parole is another part of the puzzle that's really important. And I know we're struggling for probation and parole agents in Jefferson County. I believe that's the case other, other places. Wow. Um, 
I talked to a probation and parole agent um, who lives in our county but works in Madison. And, and I asked this agent specifically, why wouldn't you want to work in Jefferson County? Because, um, you know, you wouldn't have to drive as far. And she said to me, well, there's no resources for people here. I'm not going to be able to help any of our people oh. because there's a lack of resources. That's sad. And that just struck me like, yeah. you know, that's a tough thing. And, um, and so, yeah, if even a probation or parole agent who is try, you know, wants to do the right thing doesn't have the resources for her people, um, I think that speaks volumes that we got to figure things out, out yep, here. Definitely, definitely. Well, I thank you for being here today. Thank you.